This is level one of the CFA program, topic on ethics and professional standards, and the very last recording on this very long reading on the guidance for standards one through seven and ethics applications. I'm going to go ahead and skip over these LOSs since you've seen these seven times. Let's go ahead and jump right into standard seven responsibilities. So we'll take this with two components, conducts as, conduct as participants and then references. All right, so let's read this first one directly from the handbook. Uh, Must not engage in any conduct that jeopardizes CFA institutes or the CFA designations reputation or integrity. So this standard, at least on some levels, could be considered as perhaps a summary of all of the first six standards, but then with an added layer of reputation and validity and the security. Hmm. All right, so look at that second uh, circle arrow point. Holds members and candidates to a high ethical criterion while participating in the program. CFA members are proud of their accomplishments. And I can surely attest to this when uh, when I was fortunate enough to get through level three, I went to my students and I, I told them uh, how proud I was of, of that accomplishment. And then over the years, I've had students take the exams and I even have students who, who take the level one exam before or right after they graduate and then uh, and then they let me know you know a year or two later that they have passed and uh, the joy in their voices is really quite uh, it's quite a thing to behold and so this is what you're on the threshold of becoming right you want to be members of the club and it's a lot of hard work it's a lot of hard studying and it's listening to me for all of these hours and hours and hours hopefully i have uh, been able to streamline uh, your studying all right, confidential information. Of course, all aspects of the exam are considered confidential unless the CFA Institute could, I mean, you know, let's suppose that it gave a test today and then tomorrow it could publish the test on its webpage and say, here, here's a discussion board. Tell us what you think about uh, this question or that question. So as soon as they, as soon as they announce it, now, of course, they don't do stuff like that, but, uh, but they could. Yes, yeah, so what does this mean? This is a great testable point. It includes questions, broad topical areas, and formulas that were actually tested or that, uh, or that were not tested. How about some examples here that would be a violation? I counted 10 questions, right? There are very few questions on options. Uh, the bond equivalent yield formula, you know, we could, we could go on and on. I, you know, we could say something like, oh, there were no CAPM questions on the exam or boy, that credit default swap question. I, I didn't like that one at all. Yeah, look at the bottom there. The standard does not prohibit candidates from discussion, discussing non-confidential information or the curriculum material in study groups in preparation for the exam. And of course, that's pretty much what we're doing here. Program restrictions, you know, you gotta have the right calculator you, uh, you can't take in a wheelbarrow full of uh, personal items into the exam. And then you have to, have to make a pledge for integrity and validity and security and all those good things. Yeah, look down at the bottom there. Must not disclose confidential information gained prior to, during, or even after the exam. You cannot talk about questions appearing on the exam. Uh, deliberations related to the exam process and scoring details. Uh, I think I've said this in a previous recording that, you know, we really, we really don't know what a, what a passing score is. And really, it, it's, it's almost irrelevant what the passing score is. What, what I'm trying to get you guys to do is to be comfortable with the material so that you can answer correctly a majority of those questions. And then hopefully that majority, whatever it is, is, is good enough to pass. But, uh, you know, from experience, I do know that candidates who, who have not passed have, uh, you know, rededicated themselves and say, okay, this is what I did the first time and I, I didn't have a good enough score. So then I need to do this much <laughs> the next time. And I think those kinds of comments are okay. 
Yeah, you can have opinions here and feel free to express opinions. What's that quote there? Curriculum contains too many readings. Um, you know, when you when you watch my recordings, a lot of times I like to make a comment about about the reading and some of the readings I, I love. Most of the readings are, are really good. Uh, every once in a while, there'll be something that's written in there that uh, I might pause. Um, but, you know, you can say anything about the about how many readings there are. And, and all of those, uh, all the topics. And, and personally, you know, I'm in favor of, I'm in favor of expanding. You know, I want to go way, way out here and I want to go deeper and deeper because, you know, as a good financial analyst, you're going to run into clients who have tons and tons of questions. But remember how we talked about in one of these previous standards that, you know, the, the program and the CFA designation is not design to cover all eventualities and all possibilities. And so what we need to do is use the training that the Institute provides us so that we can address we can address those issues and arrive at some reasonable conclusion that is beneficial to the client. What are violations? Cheating on any CFA Institute examination. Boy, that that makes per perfect sense. Violating the rules. I think I've said this to you before. You know, you'll you'll go and sit down and, you know, the proctor will say something like, OK, you can now open your book. And then at some point, the proctor will say, OK, put your pencils down. And so you need to do that. You need to do that immediately. Yeah, providing confidential exam information to candidates or to the public. You know, back in the old days when I was taking the exams, you know, I took it on the eastern coast of the United States. So uh, I think my exam was from, I think it was 9 to 12 back in those days, the first part. And so I guess what I could have done is, now I didn't even have a cell phone back then, but I guess what I could have done was I could have called my buddy out in California and say, hey, here's a, here are all the questions on the exam. Of course, that would have been a violation, and I would never, ever do something like that. Uh, I tell my students all the time in class, I say, look, you either have integrity or you don't. I've probably said that in, uh, in one of these recordings as well. So integrity, let's, uh, let's practice that. Let's be perfect uh, in our integrity. Improperly using an association with the CFA Institute. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, remember the Institute is this, is this body out here and we're working around it and we're working inside and outside and we're trying to figure out how we're supposed to behave and the Institute gives us these sets of rules. And then, boy, we had a whole standard on misrepresentation, so we don't want to do that. All right, let's start with an exam question here uh, with a sample question. Just completed CFA level one exam. He posts a series of tweets. Okay. CFA Institute is a joke. Level one exam was truly awful. Examiners expected too much. Far too difficult. I was prepared for financial reporting and analysis section and was disappointed there weren't as many questions as expected. I counted 25 in total. All right. So it sounds to me like, you know, those first couple of sentences there, boy, they're, they're not pleasant. Uh, and they're not fun to read, but they're probably not violations because we're just offering some kind of an opinion, a general opinion. But then once we get into specifics, this is a, a violation. This is far different from the 48 I expected. I was also surprised to see no derivatives. All right. So how has uh, this candidate most likely violated? And, and by the way, um, when you get to the exam, not just these questions, when you get to all the exam questions, make sure that you read very carefully. I say this before, but this question here in particular, sometimes, sometimes you'll get a question that says most likely, sometimes you'll get a question that says least likely. So make sure you differentiate uh, between those two. All right, expressing his opinion about difficulty, revealing details by expressing a negative opinion. So we probably don't like the details about the parts of uh, the, uh, about the exam. Go skip down to the bottom. Wright is allowed to express his opinion about the CFA Institute and the difficulty of the exam. All right, how about the second component here? The use of the designation, the CFA program, and the Institute itself. All right, must not misrepresent. And I, I don't know that the misrepresentation is as key of an issue as the overstating the meaning. You know, like for example, when I 
uh, when I distribute my syllabus at the beginning of every semester to the students, um, you know, I have I have my name, comma, PhD, comma, CFA. I don't have in parentheses, like after the PhD, I don't have like, hey, I wrote a really awesome dissertation on poison pill securities, although I could do that. And I don't have in parentheses after CFA, I don't have, hey, I'm really, really smart because I passed uh, these three levels of exams, right? So all I'm doing is I'm just, uh, I'm just telling people that, uh, um, that I have the right to use the designation. And of course, notice what we have in the, in the bottom box there, promote and protect the CFA as, as a brand name, yeah elevates the CFA charter as a high level achievement earned on merit. Of course, uh, charter holders should not cheapen it. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. All right. So who's a member here? So a CFA Institute member refers to regular and affiliate members, right? So what do we have to do? We have to professionally conduct statement annually. Uh, you'll see this now, those of you in level one, um, sometime in the, for me, it comes in the summertime. Maybe that's just a standard one. And so during the summertime, I have to complete a professional conduct statement that uh, asks me a whole series of questions. I have to pass that and then I have to pay the dues. Using the CFA designation. So there you go. I, I use the letters capital C, capital F, capital A. I don't ever write out chartered financial analysts, but I, uh, I tell anybody who asks that, yes, I hold the chartered financial analyst designation. And there's what I was saying earlier. I can't claim or imply superior investment performance because of holding the charter. Now, remember that until you pass all three levels, you're still considered a candidate. You're a candidate only if you're enrolled to sit for a specific exam and you cannot, you know, I've had students who've asked me this uh, over the years, like they're registered for the level one exam and they want to put this on their resume. And, you know, I'll say something like, well, you need to be super careful about what you put on the resume. You can't say things like, oh, I'm in the CFA program and I'm super smart. You can't, you can't say stuff like that. But you can uh, you can say that you are enrolled and you are preparing to uh, take the exam in you know whenever you're going to take it. Yeah, this is always a good exam question. So uh, you're supposed to use this uh, designation not as a noun, but uh, but as an adjective. So I am one of five CFAs in the investment department. Nope, that's right out. But I and one of five CFA charter holders in the investment department. So that makes that makes perfect sense. Uh, you can also say I hold the uh, CFA designation. So there you go. Look at the bottom there. This is the way I use mine. I have PhD in there as well. You can't put any decimals in there. And why would you want to do uh, uh, lowercase letters? And then, of course, you can't say, uh, you know, Jim's Investment Company. I couldn't be Jim's CFA Investment Company. Can't put it in bold. You can't put it in italics. Uh, you can't change the colors. You can't, uh, I don't know, what else can you do with uh, software? You know, whatever, whatever your name is, however your name appears, then just remember that that's probably the way uh, the letter CFA ought to appear. Which of the following is an improper reference? Enrolling in the CFA program has made me a better quality valuation analyst than my peers. That might be, it could be true. That could be true. Uh, I am a February level one candidate. I've passed all three and may be eligible subject to completion. Yeah, so uh, saying something about I'm superior, that's pretty much uh, right out the window. Oh boy, that takes us through all of the seven standards. We have just these three learning outcome statements. And so are you ready for this one? I'm going to tell you to go uh, look at those 30 some questions. What are there? 34, 39, some of them. But I want you to pay 
particular attention to one of them. It, it, it was on, it's a question written on this, uh, on this last standard. And don't ever accuse the Institute of not having a sense of humor. There's a question in the very end, it's in the 30s, maybe 32, 34, 36 question, whatever it's in there. It's a big old question stem. And it refers to a third party uh, who's providing some prep guidance for a candidate. And the candidate says, uh, it publicly says something like, you know, this third party, uh, these people stink and these people stink and these people stink. And it, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of comical in there. So go ahead and read that one. Read the rest of them. So you have those 30 some questions in there. Hopefully you've been through them seven times. I'm hoping that at now you're up to, boy, 90% success rate, maybe even pushing 100% success rate after you've seen these questions. But I promise you, going over those over and over after each one of these readings is going to help you tremendously to prepare for the exam. And then go to our question bank and our mock exams, and that will layer, layer what the Institute has done for us and, uh, and help you in your preparation. So thank you for watching these, uh, these seven videos, in addition to all the other recordings that we have made. Uh, have a great day and good luck studying.